Hello, I'm Valerie Reed, and in honor of October, I'm going to read to you from a spooky story. It's a novel. It was published in 1962 by Ray Bradbury, and it is called Something Wicked, This Way Comes. Now, the title is taken from uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, when one of the witches says, by the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. And definitely into Greentown, Illinois, somewhere in the 1940s, two boys, uh, Will and Jim, into their lives, something wicked definitely comes. It is a carnival, Mr. Dark's Carnival. And in reality, Dark is a malevolent being who, like the carnival, lives off the life force of those it enslaves. Now, I'm reading from the beginning of the book. I do have to skip over parts to make it fit into our time slot. But here we go. Something wicked this way comes. First of all, it was October, a rare month for boys. Not that all months aren't rare, but be, there be bad and good, as the pirates say. Take September, a bad month. School begins. Consider August, a good month. School hasn't begun yet. July, well, July's really fine. There's no chance in the world for school. June, no doubting it, June's best of all. For the school doors spring wide and September's a billion years away. But you take October now. School's been on a month and you're riding easier in the rains, jogging along. You got time to think of the garbage you'll dump on old man Prickett's porch or the hairy ape costume you'll wear to the YMCA the last night of the month. And if it's around October 20th and everything's smoky smelling in the sky orange and ash gray at twilight, it seems Halloween will never come in a fall of broomsticks and a soft flap of bedsheets around corners. But one strange, wild, dark, long year, Halloween, came early. One year, Halloween came on October 24th, three hours after midnight. At that time, James Nightshade of 97 Oak Street was 13 years, 11 months, 23 days old. Next door, William Halloway was 13 years, 11 months, and 24 days old. Both touched toward 14. It almost trembled in their hands. And that was the October week when they grew up overnight and were never so young anymore. Midnight then, and the town clocks chiming on toward one and two, and then three in the deep morning, and the peals of the great clock shaking dust off old toys in attics. Will heard it. Muffled away in the prairie lands, the chuffing of an engine, the slow, slow following drag and glide of a train. Will sat up in bed. Across the way, like a mirror image, Jim sat up too. A calliope began to play, oh, so softly, grieving to itself, a million miles away. In one single motion, Will leaned from his window, as did Jim. Without a word, they gazed over the trembling surf of trees. There on the precipice of earth, a small steam feather uprose like the first of a storm cloud yet to come. The train itself appeared, link by link, Engine, coal car, and numerous and numbered all asleep in slumbering, dream-filled cars. Even at this remote view, one imagined men with buffalo-haunched arms shoveling black meteor falls of coal into the open boilers of the engine. The flags! The cages! It's the carnival! Let's go watch them set up! At 3 a.m.? At 3 a.m.? Jim vanished. Jim, wait! Will thrashed into his clothes. Jim, don't go alone, and followed after. And they ran from town across fields and both froze under a rail bridge with the moon ready beyond the hills and the meadows trembling with a fur of dew. Wham! 
The carnival train thundered the bridge. The calliope wailed. There's no one playing it, Jim stared up. Jim, no jokes. Mother's honor, look. The boys ran. They climbed a last rise to look down. Boy, whispered Jim. The train had pulled off into Ralph's moon meadow. The carnival train was crouched there now in the autumn grass on the old spur near the woods, and the boys crept and lay down under a bush waiting. It's so quiet, whispered Will. The train just stood in the middle of the dry autumn field. No one in the locomotive, no one in the tender, no one in any of the cars behind, all black under the moon, and just the small sounds of its metal cooling, ticking on the rails. Shh, said Jim. I feel them moving in there. Will felt the cat fuzz on his body bramble up by the thousands. Do you think they mind us watching? Maybe, said Jim happily. Look, a tall man stepped down from the train. All dark suit, shadow-faced, he waded to the center of the meadow, his shirt as black as the gloved hands. He now stretched to the sky. He gestured once, and the train came to life. At first, a head lifted in one window, then an arm, then another head like a puppet in a marionette theater. Suddenly, two men in black were carrying a dark tent pole out across the hissing grass. The ringmaster stood in the middle of the land. In the night, the boys felt the men rushed to unseen tasks. In the meadow stood the skeleton main poles and wires of the main tent, waiting. The clouds blew away. The men were gone. The tents rippled like black rain on their poles, and suddenly it seemed a long way to town. Instinctively, Will glanced behind himself, nothing but grass and whispers. Slowly, he looked back at the silent, dark, seemingly empty tents. I don't like it, he said. Jim could not tear his eyes away. Yeah, he whispered. Yeah. Will stood up. Jim lay on the earth. Jim, said Will. Jim jerked his head as if slapped. He was on his knees. He swayed up, his body turned, but his eyes were fastened to those black slags. Cloud shadows panicked them over the hills to the edge of town. From there, the two boys ran alone. The next morning, the sun rose yellow as a lemon. The sky was round and blue. Will and Jim leaned from their windows. Nothing had changed except the look in Jim's eyes. Last night, said Will, did or didn't it happen? They both gazed toward the far meadows. Four minutes later, Cornflakes lurching in their stomachs, they frisked, frisked the leaves to a fine red dust going out of town. With a wild flutter of breath, they raised their eyes from the earth they had been treading, and the carnival was there. Hey, it's just a plain old carnival, said Will. Like heck, said Jim. We weren't blind last night. Come on. A bad thing happened at sunset. Jim vanished. Through noon and afternoon, they had screamed up half the rides, knocked over dirty milk bottles, smashed Cupid doll winning plates, smelling, listening, looking their way through the autumn crowd, trampling the leafy sawdust. And then, quite suddenly, Jim was gone. And Will, not asking anybody but himself, absolutely silent, sh certain, sure, walked steadily through the late crowd as the sky was turning plum-colored until he came to the maze of mirrors and paid his dime and stepped up inside and called softly just one time. Jim, and Jim was there, half in, half out of the cold glass like someone abandoned on the seashore when a close friend has gone far out and there is wonder if he will ever come back. Jim stood as if he had not moved so much as an eyelash in five minutes, staring, his mouth half open, waiting for the next wave to come in and show him more. Jim, get out of there. Will, Jim sighed faintly. Let me be. Like heck, with one leap, Will grabbed Jim's belt and hauled, shuffling backward. Jim did not seem to know he was being dragged from the maze, for he kept protesting in awe at some unseen wonder. Oh, Will, oh, Willie, Will, oh, oh, Willie.
Jim, you not, I'm taking you home. What? What, what, what? They were in cold air. The sky was darker than plum snow with a few clouds burning late sun fire above. The sun fire flamed on Jim's feverish cheeks, his open lips, his wide and terribly rich green shining eyes. Jim, what did you see in there? What? What? I'm going to bust your nose. Come on. He hustled, pulled, shoved, half carried this fever, this elation, unstruggling friend. Can't tell you, Will. Wouldn't believe. Can't tell you in there. Oh, oh, in there? In there? Shut up. Will socked his arm. Scare heck out of me. It's almost supper time. Folks will think we're dead and buried. Will, we got to come back tonight. Okay, come back alone. Jim stopped. You wouldn't let me come alone. You're always going to be around, aren't you, Will, to protect me? <laughs> Look who needs protection. Will laughed and then did not laugh again, for Jim was looking at him, the last wild light dying in his mouth and caught in the thin hollows of his nostrils and in his suddenly deep-set eyes. Jim, in ten minutes, sure. The midway will be dark. Everyone home for dinner. Just us alone. But won't it feel great? Just us? And here we go. Back in. The boy stood along, among, stood alone among the encampments of dusk, thinking of all the boys in town sitting down to warm food in bright rooms. The red-lettered sign said, Out of order. Keep out. Keep off. Sign's been up all day. I don't believe signs, said Jim. Don't look broke to me. Jim ambled across the clanking chain, leaped to a turntable surface, vast as the moon. Jim! Will, this is the only ride we haven't looked at. So... Jim swayed. The lunatic carousel world stirred a tilt with his lean bulk. He strolled through brass forests amidst animal rousts. He swung astride a plum dusk stallion. Ho oh boy, get! A man rose from the machinery darkness. <gasps> Jim! Reaching out from the shadows among the calliope tubes and moonskin drums, the man hoisted Jim, yelling out in the air, Help, Will, help! Will leaped through the animals. The man smiled easily, welcomed him handily, swung him high beside Jim. They stared down at bright flame red hair, bright flame blue eyes, and rippling biceps. Out of, order, out of order, said the man. Can't you read? Put them down, said a gentle voice. Hung high, Jim and Will glanced over at a second man, standing tall beyond the chains. Down, he said again. And they were carried through the brass forest of wild but uncomplaining brutes and set in the dust. We were, said Will, curious. The second man was tall as a lamppost. His pale face, lunar pockmarks denting it, cast light on those who stood below. His vest was the color of fresh blood. His eyes, brows, his hair, his suit were licorice black, and the sun-yellow gem, which stared from the tie pin thrust in his cravat, was the same unblinking shade and bright crystal as his eyes. The man stood, moon calm, inhabiting his itchweed suit and watching Jim's mouth with his yellow eyes. He never looked once at Will. The name is Dark. He flourished a white calling card. It turned blue. Dark. And my friend with the red hair there is Mr. Cougar of Cougar and Dark's. Names appeared, disappeared on the white square. Combined shadow shows and cross-continental pandemonium, pandemonium theater company. He handed the card to Jim. It now read, our specialty to examine oil, polish, and repair death watch beetles. Mr. Dark nodded. What's your name, boy? Don't tell him, thought Will, and stopped. Why not, he wondered. Why? Jim's lips hardly twitched. Simon, he said. He smiled to show it was a lie. Mr. Dark smiled to show he knew it. Want to see more, Simon? Jim would not give him the satisfaction of a nod. Slowly, with great mouth-working pleasure, Mr. Dark pushed his sleeve high to the elbow. Jim stared. The arm was like a cobra, weaving, bobbing, swaying to strike. Mr. Dark clenched his fist, wiggled his fingers, and the muscles danced. Will wanted to run around and see, but could only watch, thinking, 
Jim, oh, Jim. For there stood Jim, and there was this tall man, each examining the other as if he were a reflection in a shop window late at night. Jim stared, and Will could not see, and a long way off, the last of the town people went away toward town in their warm cars, and Jim said faintly, Gosh, and Mr. Dark rolled down his sleeve. Show is over. Supper time. Carnival's shut up until seven. Everyone out. Come back, Simon, and ride the merry-go-round when it's fixed. Take this card. Free ride. Jim stared at the hidden wrist and put the card in his pocket. So long. Jim ran. Will ran. Jim whirled, glanced back, leaped, for the, and for the second time in the hour, vanished. Will looked up into the tree where Jim squirmed on a limb, hidden. Mr. Dark and Mr. Cougar were turned away, busy with the merry-go-round. Quick, Will! Jim? They'll see you. Jump! Will jumped. Jim hauled him up. The great tree shook. A wind roared by in the sky. Jim helped him cling, gasping among the branches. Jim, we don't belong here. Shut up. Look, whispered Jim. What was on his arm, Jim? A picture. Yeah, but what kind? It was, Jim shut his eyes. It was a, it was a picture of a, of a snake. That's it, snake. But when he opened his eyes, he would not look at Will. Okay, if you don't want to tell me, I told you, Will, a snake. I'll get him to show it to you later. You want that? No, thought Will, I don't want that. He looked down at the billion footprints left in the sawdust on the empty midway, and suddenly it was a lot closer to midnight than to noon. I'm going home. Sure, Will, go. Sure, old friend, Will, so long. I, Will started down the tree and froze. All clear, cried a voice below. Clear, someone shouted at the far end of the midway. Mr. Dark moved not 50 feet away to a red control box near the merry-go-round ticket booth. He glared in all directions. He glared into the tree. Will hugged, Jim hugged the limb, tightened into smallness. Start up with a pop. A bang, a jangle of reins, the carousel moved. But thought Will, it's broke, out of order. He flicked a glance at Jim, who pointed wildly down. The merry-go-round was running, yes, but it was running backward. The music, Will thought, it's backward too. Mr. Dark jerked about, glanced up as if he had heard Will's thoughts. A wind shook the trees in black tumult. Mr. Dark shrugged and looked away. The carousel wheeled faster, shrieking, plunging, going roundabout back. Now Mr. Cougar, with his flaming red hair and fire blue eyes, was pacing the midway, making a last check. He stood under their tree. Will could have let spit down on him. Then the calliope gave a particularly violent cry of foul murder, which made dogs howl in far counties, and Mr. Cougar, spinning, ran and leaped and flung himself into a seat where with his bristly red hair, pink face, and incredible sharp blue eyes, he sat, silent, going back around, back around, the music squealing swift, back with him like sucked-in breath. It was Jim who first noticed the new thing happening, for he kicked Will once. Will looked over, and Jim nodded frantically at the man in the machine as he came around the next time. Mr. Cougar's face was melting, like pink wax. His hands were becoming doll's hands. His bones sank away beneath his clothes. His clothes then shrank down to fit his dwindling frame. His face flickered, going, and each time around, he melted more. Will saw Jim's head shift, circling. The carousel wheeled while Mr. McCougar, as simple as shadows, as simple as light, as simple as, the time, as time, got younger and younger and younger. Each time he wheeled to view, he sat alone with his bones, which shaped like warm candles burning away to tender years. Now no longer 40, where he had begun his back spiral journey, Mr. Cougar was 19. Around went the reverse parade of horses. Mr. Cougar, Cougar was 17, 16. Another and another time around under the sky and trees and Will whispering, Jim counting the times around and around, then the carousel rocked and stood still. The figure, seated in the carved white wooden sleigh chair, was very small. Mr. Cougar was 12 years old. No, 
Will's mouth shaped the word. No, Jim's did the same. The small, strange man boy shot his gaze up, down, smelling fright somewhere, terror and awe in the vicinity. Will balled himself tight and shut his eyes. He felt the terrible gaze shoot through the leaves like brown needle darts. Pass on. Then rabbit running, the small shape lit off down the empty midway. And it was Jim who spoke from their mutual confusion and trembling as each held to the other's arm, seeing the small shadow rush, luring them across the meadow. Oh, Will, I wish we could go home. I wish we could eat, but it's too late. We saw. We got to see more, don't we? Lord, said Will miserably, I guess we do. And they ran together, following, they didn't know what, on out and away to who could possibly guess where.